There's a story about uh, a little girl who used to sit with her grandfather on the benches here on Eastern Parkway when the Rebbe came home from work before, before the Nasius. The Rebbe would come home from the Navy Yard. He would walk down the street and the grandfather would usually be sitting there with his granddaughter. She was 12 years old and the Rebbe would stop to speak to them. And he would ask her what she's learning in school. She went to public school. One time the Rebbe asked her what she likes to read. So she said she likes to read um, science fiction. So the Rebbe said, Who, whose books do you like best? So she mentioned the name of the author. Because there were many science fiction writers. She mentioned one of them that she liked the best. So the Rebbe said, why do you like him the best? She said, because he has a, 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 a plan or a, a, a vision to fix the whole world. So the Rebbe said, yeah, I do too. <laughs> I also have a plan to fix the whole world. And, and it wasn't an exaggeration. But what does it mean to fix the whole world? Who can have such dreams, such plans? You're going to change the whole world. Is that, is that realistic? So the mice is like this. The reason the title was given 3,000 years ago was to change the whole world. The reason Hasidus was started 200 years ago or 300 years ago was to change the whole world. The reason that the Friedrich Rebbe came to America rather than going to Israel is because from America you can change the whole world. So this plan of changing the whole world is an old plan. The question is, how far have we gotten? How much progress have we made? One of the things that the Rebbe did was that he made us all partners in that plan. Because by the Rebbe Rasha, by the Rebbe Marash, every person was responsible to make his world better. The Rebbe made us all responsible to make the whole world better. Is that realistic? So when you go out into the world, you'll see it is very realistic. Because what's happening in the world today that is different from, let's say, 100 years ago, a hundred years ago, every country had a great leader. Russia had czars. Other places had kings, emperors. They were powerful leaders. And people believed that their leader, their king, their czar, their emperor was going to solve their problems, was going to make life better. Today, you don't have that any place in the world. Maybe China still thinks they have something, but who knows what they think. <laughs> they don't tell anybody. So the whole world basically knows that they don't have any leaders. So what's going to make the world better? So let's say 50 years ago, people believed that if you have enough money, you can make the whole world better. You just need money. So all the countries, instead of trying to have great leaders, tried to make a lot of money. Now we know that having money is not a solution to anything. Because even a country that has money, overnight, 
everything collapses and you lose all your money. So what do people, the average man in the street, what is he hoping for? What hope does he have? He doesn't have great leaders. His money is not worth anything. The scientists aren't inventing anything new, except electronic games. <laughs> What's happening to the world? We're not finding cures. So medicine is not making any great progress. Science is not making any great progress. Money is worth nothing. We don't have any leadership. Religion is a disaster. What's left? So if science is not the answer, and money is not the answer, and po po political leaders is not the answer, and religion is not the answer, so what's left? That's the world right now. You stop the average person in the street, any place in the world, and you say, what are you, what are you hoping for? What's... They don't know. There's nothing left anymore. So the Navi says that there will come a time that's going to be very intense. It's going to be a real crisis. But it will not be a hunger for bread. And it, not, well, it won't be a thirst for water. What it will be, people will want to know what is the emes? That's, that's how Rambam describes Yemei Samashiach. In Yemei Samashiach, Madanim Ka'ofa, everybody will have plenty of food, but it won't be interesting. What people will be interested in is to know, is to know what the Ebishter wants. So let me explain this a little bit even according to science. For hundreds of years, the great scientists, the Einsteins, have been trying to figure out how the world works and how it started. And they have all sorts of theories, good theories, not such good theories, but what are they trying to figure out? They're trying to figure out how the world works came into, at this point, the scientists are stuck. They're stuck. They can't, they can't go any further. Because if you're going to figure out how the world started, how do you do it? You find what is the first thing that existed. Because everything begins at a beginning. One thing. What is that one thing that existed in the beginning? So there's a famous marshal. How do you know that the Ebishta created the world? It's very simple. If I showed you a book, and I told you that the book, nobody wrote it. A bottle of ink spilled, and by accident it dried in the form of these words and letters and sentences and paragraphs, it's just an accident. Of course, you wouldn't believe it. You would say, no, if a bottle of ink spills, it can't write a book. That makes sense. Must be somebody did it. So that proves that the world that is so structured and so smart, it can't be that it happened by accident. It must be that Ebishta created. Now that muscle is not a very good one. Because maybe it is possible that a bottle of ink can spill and write a book. How do you know it's not possible? Because it never happened. Of course it never happened. Such a thing can only happen once, and it will never happen again. 
if you say the world was created, no matter how you explain it, it only happened once, it'll never happen again. And whatever happened that one time, we can't figure out because it never happened again. So maybe a bottle of ink spilled and wrote a book and it'll never happen again. The problem with the marshal, or the, the proof from the marshal, is like this. If I told you that in the beginning there was nothing but a bottle of ink, it spilled and wrote a book, what's your problem with that story? That a bottle of ink can't write a book? How do you know it can't? The problem with the bottle of ink is if there's only a bottle of ink, that's all there is in the whole world, why did it spill? <laughs> you say, oh, the wind knocked it over. Oh, so there was a wind. No, an earthquake. <laughs> so if you're starting with just a bottle of ink, Nothing would knock it over. Nothing would make it spill. So here's the problem. Whatever you start with, why will it change? Let's say in the beginning there was just an apple. Yeah, okay. And then what happened? It exploded? <laughs> why did it explode? So here's the problem. If you go back to the first thing that existed, you have a very big kasha. Not how did it explode, how did it write a book. The kasha is why. Why did it spill? Why did it explode? If you only have one thing, then that's how it's going to remain forever. Why is it going to change? So what do we know? We know that in the beginning there was only the Ebishter. And then what? What happened? The Ebishter had a taiva for a dira betachtainim. So what made the world exist? The Abishta wanted something. In other words, the world exists not because of a how. It exists because of a why. And that's the problem with science, that the scientists are now stuck. That's it. They can't go any further. Because the next step is to ask why there's a world. The scientists can't deal with this. They can deal with how. But how will never explain why the world exists. Does this make sense? Yeah? Hello? Yeah. It's not Gemara. This you can understand. <laughs> no, that's not a question. An original thing is original. It's, it's the real thing. The question is, if it's so real and so perfect, why did it explode? Time? Time? Who created time? <laughs> there was only a bottle of ink. There was no time. Huh? Where was it? Everywhere. Because there was no space. Exactly like the Ebeshte. Where was the Ebeshte? It was everywhere. How old was he? <laughs> there was no time. So whatever it was, is the perfect existence, the perfect thing, and from it, everything else comes. But why? Why didn't it just remain by itself? So you can't say something made it. There was, no, there was nothing else. The only explanation is that thing that is perfect and original wanted something. 
Okay, so now you're talking about an Eibushter. Don't call it a bottle of ink. Call it Eibushter. So if the bottle of ink wanted to write a book, so why are you calling it a bottle of ink? Then it's the Eibushter. Then it's an intelligent, original being that created the world. That's, that's what we're saying. But here's the, the important point. It doesn't matter whether you call it Abish, their God, or whatever. There has to be a why, not a how. And why, scientists can't. How, do they, how are they supposed to know why? The only way we can know why is if the Abish that tells us what he wanted. Otherwise, we'll never know. So this is what's going to happen next week, a month from now. The scientists are going to come out and say, we're finished. We can't go any further with how. Now we have to ask why. Let me give you a good example. If a person is sleeping, and, he's, and, and it's a very good, comfortable sleep, why does he wake up? It's so good. He's so comfortable. It's so perfect. Why do you mess it up? Why do you wake up? Now you ask yourself this question every morning. You were sleeping so well. You were so comfortable, so relaxed. Why, why, did, why did you wake up? So people say, well, uh, there was noise. Okay, if there's no noise, why would you wake up? Well, because you're not tired anymore. That's never a good excuse. <laughs> you can sleep ain't safe. <laughs> why do you wake up? There's only one answer. You wake up because you want something. Chas <laughs> v'sholem. A person who really doesn't want anything doesn't wake up. A person wakes up because he wants. In other words, he's very comfortable. It's very nice to be sleeping. It's very relaxing. It's, very, it's perfect. But he wants something else. So it wakes him up. The Ebeshter was perfect. The, there was only Abish there, there were no problems, there was no conflicts, there was no, there was no snow, there was no emergencies, there was no... Everything was perfect. Why did he mess it up? Because it was perfect, and he wanted something else. The want disturbed the peace. That's the only answer. There cannot be any other answer to why the world exists. The only reason is because no matter how perfect it was before, somebody wanted something. There was a taiva, a rotsen. That's why the most intelligent answer, the most intelligent explanation for why we exist is because somebody wanted something. When the world admits that that's the question, what are they going to do next? They're going to need to know who wanted and what did he want. Now, who wanted, most people already know. Whether it's Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, everybody knows God created the world. So what's left? The only question left is, what did he want? He created the world because he wanted it. But what does he want? When that becomes the question, who are people going to turn to? 
Who are they going to ask? That's what the Rebbe is telling us. The time is coming when the world is going to realize that the only important thing is to know what the Ebeshter wants. That's going to become the subject, that's going to become the topic, that's going to become the only issue and problem in the world. Do you know what to say? Can you explain it? Do you know what to tell them? That's what the Rebbe was telling us. Every Jew is a shliach. Not now, not today, but next week. So do you know how to answer the question? Do you know what to say? What does the Ebeshter want? What does it mean that the Ebeshter wants? How much does he want? How important is it to him? Can you explain these things? That's what you're learning. You are learning the answer to a question that the whole world is going to ask, if not this week, next week. So since the Rebbe was way ahead of his time and saw what was coming because Chacham Adif Minovi, he started to prepare us. And to be prepared, you have to have a number of things. Number one, Yiddishkeit is not about you. By everybody else, everybody's Yiddishkeit, by other chsidim, by the Litvisha, by the Yeshivisha, everybody's Yiddishkeit is about you. Are you a Talmud Chocham? Are you a Tzaddik? Are you a, 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 a Godel? Are you a failure? Are you a Shlomazel? It's all about you. Are you going to go to Gan Eden? Are you going to get schar? Are you going to get punishment? It's all about you. The Rebbe said, if you want to be prepared for what's coming, get this through your head. It's not about you. It's not whether you're going to be a tzaddik. And it's not whether you're going to go to Gan Eden. It's a much bigger question than that. So you can't be a private citizen. You can't decide, eh, I don't know, I'm not interested. It's not about you. It's like a person who has medical knowledge. But he doesn't want to be a doctor. He's not in the mood. I'm sorry, you can't do that. If people are sick and you know how to cure them, it's not up to you to decide whether you're in the mood. It's not about you. It's about the patient. So number one, the Rebbe doesn't let us be private citizens. You are responsible for the whole world. You're responsible for every Jew in the world. You are responsible for the Abishta's plan. You are not a private citizen. And it's not a question of whether you're a good Jew or not a good Jew. It's not about you. That's number one. And that, I think... Almost every Lubavitcher, for better, more or less, every Lubavitcher has that. That the Rebbe succeeded. That every Lubavitcher who ever learned a word of Hasidus knows it's not enough that he is a good Jew. He feels responsible. You're sitting on a plane and you find out that the guy sitting next to you is Jewish and you checked your tefillin on and you don't have them with you? You feel guilty. Only a Lubavitcher. Because this, the Rebbe had success in making sure that we don't feel like private citizens. I put on film, that's all I need to care about. No such thing. Number two. Until recently, nobody needed to know why the Abishta created the world. And that's why nobody taught these things. What's your business why David should created the world? He told you what to do? Do it. You need to know why he created the world. That's why, isn't it strange? Where does it say why David created the world? 
Where does it say Nesava Hakadosh Baruch Hu Lies Leidira B'Tachtena? Huh? In a medrash someplace. It's just like, what? It's not important enough to put it in the Chumash. It's not important enough that it should be one of the Ten Commandments. It's the whole reason for which he created the world. You have to go look in a medrash to find it? For most of history, it was none of your business. It's none of your business why the Abishta created the world. It's his world. You're living in his world. You do what he tells you to do. What's the question? You're living in somebody's house. You're a guest in somebody's house. He has to explain to you why he put the dining, the dining table into that room and not in the other room. He has to explain to you why he has certain food in the refrigerator, not other food. He doesn't have to tell you anything. It's his house. You're a guest. So if he tells you not to touch the, the dishes, you don't touch the dishes. He has to tell you why. But in our generation, after Tom Chetmimim, after the Rebbe Rashab started Achsidusha Yeshiva, all of a sudden, Everyone is entitled to know the whole plan why the Abishta created the world. And why do we need to know it now? Because the whole world is reaching a point where that's going to be the only question. What does he want? And we have to know the answer. Number three, the story with the, uh, the girl with the science fiction book. The Fidi Kerebbe could have gone to Israel or some other country. Why did he choose to come to America? One of the main reasons is because America runs the whole world. Israel is trying to be Israel. It's not trying to run the world. So the people in Israel are just thinking about their own survival. Americans are unique. An American thinks global. Communists also thought global. But their thinking was, how can we destroy the whole world? Global. Americans think global, but positive. How can we make every country rich so that they'll buy our cars, <laughs> which will make us richer? It's a certain mentality, a certain way of thinking big. Let's go to the moon. <laughs> go to the moon? You have nothing better to do? Then they were planning to go further. They wanted to go to a star, which would take 800 years. That's a plan. Velvel Green, the professor, came to the Rebbe. And this was when he was working with uh, the Space Administration. And they started talking about going to a star. And of course, they were debating whether there's life in uh, space, on other planets, whatever. So at that point, Velva was already becoming a religious Jew. So he says to the Rebbe, we don't believe in life on other planets, do we? And the Rebbe was not happy with that. The Rebbe said, believe we don't believe you're a scientist go take a look <laughs> you're going to sit here and decide there is there isn't i believe i don't believe what is this you're a scientist go take a look and secondly the rebbe said why do you assume that there is no life what the that can't create more than what you see 
Why are you limiting the Ebishter? So it makes it sound like the Rebbe at least was open to the idea that there is life on other planets. I mean, why not? Think big. So these are the three things that make you a Labavitch or Chosid. These are the three things that the Rebbe has had an effect on us. Number one, you're not a private citizen. Number two, you know the whole plan. You have the answer to the question that the world is going to ask, but you have to be able to explain it and be intelligent about it. And number three, you have to think big. We're changing the whole world. Not just ourselves, not just Jews, the whole world. Now the Rebbe saw it so clearly that this question is going, that every day that went by and the people did not reach that conclusion, the Rebbe was disappointed. Because it could have happened a month ago, it could have happened 10 years ago. Why does it have to take so long? So every day that the people didn't ask that question was like a delay in the coming of Mashiach. Being on Shlichus is basically a practical way of doing these three things. Don't be a private citizen. If you go on Shlichus, you're not a private citizen. So the better you learn now, the better you'll be able to handle the challenge when it comes, because it is going to come. And that's why it's important that you not memorize what you learn, but understand what you learn. Because if you don't really understand it, you're not going to be able to explain it. People will want explanation. So if you're learning something and you don't really understand it, learn it again. Ask all the right questions until you really understand it so that you can explain it to others.